And um, it's already starting. Um, or no, Hot. Hot was is the name of the album. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to a Thursday Collection Connection. And if you're here and I'm here, doesn't that make it our time? Is there anything wrong with talking about records on our time? I think not. I play the game with my brother, Plastic Eric from the Plastic Soundwave Cult, and you can play along and follow along by subscribing to both channels. Something I've been meaning to mention in the last couple of episodes is that we just passed uh, the two year mark since I uploaded the very first collection connection. It took me a few months to get the second one up and uh, a little while beyond that to become uh, regular and uh, weekly and in the format that we currently do it. Uh, but it's still two, year, two years ago that uh, I uploaded my first video. And you're thinking, wow, it's only been two years. You've already got over 40 subscribers. That's true. Uh, but I try to stay humble in my success. In any case, in Eric's last video, uh, he talked about Pat Benatar's uh, Crimes of Passion album. I have an odd relationship with Pat Benatar's music. I don't think I was fully aware of it until arriving back in the States in 1984. Um, Love is a Battlefield uh, was still in pretty heavy rotation. Uh, still saw it fairly regularly on MTV. And I was all about MTV when we got back to the States. And yet that was also the time period in which I went from sort of my humble hard rock beginnings uh, where I would listen to Queen and uh, Van Halen and uh, Iron Maiden and a few things of that nature and I discovered the pop path that's really been the path that I've been on since. And yet, Pat Benatar had some great singles, but it felt like her albums were kind of a great single plus a bunch of filler. Uh, it's maybe an unfair sort of uh, impression that I had, but that was the impression that I had. And listening to Crimes of Passion didn't super dispel it, honestly. I mean, I love um, hit me with your best shot. But even the cover of Wuthering Heights feels a little bit uh, like she's doing an impression of Kate Bush. Uh, doesn't seem like she's being herself. Bending the rules, what it made me want to do and what I ended up doing was uh, listening to her next album, uh, Precious Time, a couple times over because that was the album that I had on vinyl. But again, as I bought it, it was already sort of becoming obsolete in my tastes. And so I ended up buying a Pat Benatar album and I'm not even really sure why because it wasn't anything that I listened to all that often. And yet when I listened to it here earlier this week, lots of it stuck out to me. It struck me as a very solid record. Uh, it's a Tough Life, uh, made me think of Boomtown Rats. And uh, Take It Any Way You Want It has a great chorus, all the potential in the world to have been a, a big radio hit, uh, but it was not released as a single. And of course, Promises in the Dark um, and a very creditable uh, cover of Helter Skelter. I like the cover of Helter Skelter better than her cover of Wuthering Heights. Uh, but as I uh, cleverly alluded to in the opening of the video, my connection is that Pat Benatar uh, was mentioned in the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Linda, that girl looks just like Pat Benatar. I know. Wait, there are three girls here at Ridgemont who have cultivated the Pat Benatar look. Janelle Assembler, Mary Ann Zlotnick in the red tights. Ah, the memories. And my connection was also referenced uh, in the movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And here's that scene. Can you honestly tell me that you forgot? Forgot the magnetism of Robin Zander or the charisma of Rick Nielsen? That's kid stuff. Kid stuff? 
How about the tunes? I want you to want me. So yeah, we're talking about Cheap Trick. And more specifically, their second album, 1977's In Color. Eric can correct me. My memory isn't always the best, but I feel like the time that he was picking up on Cheap Trick was about the time of Next Position, Please. So a little bit later in their catalog. And again, that came again right at that sort of um, pivotal moment where that stopped being the kind of music that I listened to. I think they've, they've been rehabbed in my mind the way they have in a lot of people's minds over time. That the appreciation for them uh, has really grown in the estimation and the, and the recognition for what a landmark band they were, so much so with me personally that I feel like, uh, to speak about it in anthropological terms, they are the first band that were recognizably human. <laughs> uh, in 1977, making power pop that I recognize in the music that I came to uh, really connect with thereafter. There was sort of a, a, a twig on the branch um, where the cars kind of went in a new wave direction and Cheap Trick went in a power pop direction. And both of those paths uh, remained viable to me. So I can hear some of the Southern Boogie faintly in the Cheap Trick music, uh, but that makes something like a Big Star it's like Australopithecus, you know? You can see where the DNA comes from, and yet it is still recognizably different from the music that uh, really came to define my experience with music. And so it's been working backwards a little bit. Uh, I knew of Cheap Trick later, later in their, uh, you know, initial run. And honestly, by the time of, like, uh, The Flame and their cover of Don't Be Cruel. I was pretty embarrassed of, of Cheap Trick at that point. And it wasn't really until the 2000s that I bought the albums that I have, which are In Color, Heaven Tonight, and uh, Dream Police, I think was even in the 2010s that I bought that. Uh, but they're, they're great records. They are uh, really at the, at the heart. You know, they are the evolution point, uh, beginning point, for everything that I hold dear personally in music. I've just never been able to connect with pre-1977 stuff in the same way. Uh, the Beatles notwithstanding, uh, the Beatles sort of don't count towards uh, any of these things. But it's interesting to me that uh, so much of what I listened to was British. Uh, that was the music that really made the impression on me. That, But then when I have gone back to really reverse engineer and, and deconstruct my own music fandom. It feels like more so than the punk bands or the art rock bands that uh, the cars and Cheap Trick are standing right there at the intersection uh, that really started my journey. And so I love uh, In Color. It's funny and it has a bit of a reputation as a slick record. And I think personally that that's entirely due to I Want You To Want Me, which uh, I can see has pretty much all of its, its edges shorn off. And people like the In Budokan uh, or At Budokan version, the live version has a lot more sort of energy in, and that has sort of seemed to cast it a, a shadow over people's opinion of the entire album. But it doesn't strike me, honestly, as that slick and that smooth. There was interestingly a, a, a 2001 or so, early 2000s uh, version, I think, um, that Cheap Trick uh, believe their own uh, critics to some degree because they are down on uh, the production of the first of, of this album. And um, should have memorized who that was. I already forget the guy's name. 
Um, but they redid the entire album just sort of for funsies with uh, Steve Albini. But it felt like an overcompensation, like they tried to put a little too much vroom into uh, I Want You to Want Me and a little bit of the rest of the album as well when I don't feel like it really needed it. Uh, it starts off great with Hello There, you know, Do You Want to Do a Number With Me? Um, and yeah, through Big Eyes, Down, I think it's all really good. I can't even necessarily come up with the exact words uh, to describe what, what the synthesis of that hard rock and boogie into the power pop, whatever, stage, um, what it is, what, what, what balancing act they're pulling off here. Um, but Southern Girls is great. I know I've already talked way too long, so um, let's just hit it with. There's a bunch of great tracks on here. Uh, I think it's reputation as sort of a soft record um, for babies, as, as the gal says there in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Uh, I think that's a little overblown and, you know, it's really good stuff. I would agree that it's a little soft on that one particular single. Uh, it would have been nice if there was a studio version that had the energy of the live at Budokan version. But that said, I'm going to pass it along to Eric. You can look for his response on Monday on his channel, Plastic Soundwave Cult. And, uh... You can enjoy some cheap trick in the meantime. You can enjoy some cheap trick in the meantime. In Color, 1977, their second album of 1977 and their second album overall. It's good stuff. It's worth your time. With that, I said my piece. So I thank you for watching. And goodbye.